I'm Gary Miller. I work for the USDA's Systematic Entomology Laboratory at Beltsville, Maryland. I'm a research entomologist working on the aphidomorpha, which includes aphids in the strict sense, adelgids, and phylloxerids. In this aphid training module, we're going to explore aphids in general. So let's proceed to the introduction to aphid identification. Aphids are members of the Sternorhynchia, that is, that group of hemiptera where their mouth parts are located in the sternal area of the venter. And these include related groups such as psyllids, white flies, and scale insects. Aphids, as some workers call aphidomorpha, include aphids in the strict sense and also include phylloxerids and adelgids. Phylloxerids and adelgids have chitinous ovipositors and as adults have reduced antennal segmentation. These won't be covered in this particular module. However, however we, we will talk about aphids in the strict sense. Aphids are very important agricultural pests, basically for three main reasons. First, due to their mechanical damage, that is direct feeding. Aphids are phloem feeders. They're also very important in virus transmission, that is plant virus diseases. And they also produce honeydew, which is a carbohydrate water composition. And this is important because it reduces photosynthesis of the plant once it's on the plant and, and makes the fruit unmarketable. Approximately 20% of the North American aphid fauna is considered adventive or invasive. So they represent a very important part in the agricultural scheme. As I mentioned before, aphids are efficient vectors of many plant viruses. And Dr. Halbert will be explaining in more detail about these, some of these viruses. But here are some examples of aphid transmitted viruses, such as the bean common mosaic virus and the soybean mosaic virus. And you can see in these illustrations and these photographs some of the modeling that occurs due to aphid transmission of the disease. Worldwide, there are approximately 5,000 species of aphids. And in North America, we have about 1,400 species of aphids. They're found predominantly in the northern hemisphere, although they can be found in the tropics and throughout the world. Many of the species exhibit a complex life cycle. That is, they have both wingless and winged adults. And the wingless adults often are a stumbling block for identification because they look so much like immature aphids. And we'll talk about a little bit about how to distinguish that in some of our other modules. They also exhibit alternation of sexual and asexual generations and alternation of host plants. That is, they may go from a woody host plant to a composite plant, let's say, and then back to a woody host plant. Accurate host plant data is extremely important. That is because some species of aphids are restricted to certain host plants. And some of the traditional keys use the host plant data in order to key species of aphids out. The adult stages are usually required, especially the wingless adults. However, winged adults can be identified, but it's important to determine whether or not that stage is actually associated with the host plant, or if it's incidental or, let's say, a hitchhiker. The immatures are routinely not identified, and the eggs are not identified. Here's an example, though, of a recently deposited egg from this oviparous uh, adult female. And you can see once it's first laid, it's light colored, and through its development, it'll gradually turn darker. Continuing with identification, some IDs can be made with a hand lens and or a stereo dissecting microscope. However, the exacting determinations and identifications require a compound microscope. And a further step to this identification aspect is the preparation of a microscope slide for use under a compound microscope. 
And we have several mo modules that will show you how to make a microscope slide for identification. The adult stage is usually required, as I mentioned before, and certain morphological characters are important for distinguishing species. Here we have a, a slide of the cotton aphid, and you can see some of these various morphological char um, characters that can be used for identification, such as an enlargement of the antenna area, the head region, the rostrum, the siphunculus, the cauda, and the genital plate shown here. Also required are measurements and ratios. If you're going to get into aphid identification, you're going to have to make measurements and use these for ratios. And some of this will be covered under the module for the lucid identification tool in another section. The general aphid morphology is shown here, and I say it's a traditional approach because this would be reflected in what you might say a printed key or book. And so you would see some of those important characters such as a terminal process and its associated base on antennal segment six, an antennal tubercle shown here in the head region, the siphunculus, again, cauda and its associated CD. Also, keys often rely on the presence or absence of secondary sensoria or ranaria, as they're called, and occasionally uh, uh, reflected also in the primary sensoria located here on the six antennal segment. Now, that would be a traditional or what you might call a paper key, but recent advances in expert systems allow us to make identifications using the Lucid training tool, or I should say the Lucid tool. And this is a expert system driven in that you have a character matrix and you may select what particular characters you would like to, to use for the identification aspects. Lucid AFID is located at aphidnet.org. And this includes an interactive glossary. It also includes fact sheets for 66 of the most prolificous or cosmopolitan species of aphids. In the morphology section, in addition to the interactive glossary, there's a visual description of all the aphids that are covered. And it also includes the, the expert tool, the lucid tool. Probably the gold standard for aphid identification, though, is listed in these selected references. And this is more of a traditional approach uh, with the publication of Blackman and Eastop's books on aphids on the world's crops, aphids on the world's trees, and aphids on the world's herbaceous plants and shrubs. And as I mentioned previously, these books require the, the use of host information. So if you have your host information, you can make an identification of an aphid on that particular host. This project would not be possible without the collaboration of those institutions listed on this slide. At this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. Why is the information on host plant important for aphid identification? Yes, uh, information on aphids and their host is it actually provides an additional point of, of uh, reference. Some aphids are very specific on the hosts that they're found upon, and others are polyphagous. So what it amounts to is you can have that additional amount of information from its host. Uh, there are some keys available to the identifier that specifically target those hosts, and you can make the identifications uh, a little quicker depending upon the, on the, the host selected. Other aphids are polyphagous, and so that requires a different set of keys. Um, so that's why that, that information is important. Is it better to have a single slide-mounted specimen when making an, ide an identification, or is it better to have a series? And if the series has more than one species, then how do you make the determination? Now, this is a good question because um, it's one of these questions where you would, would answer it depends. Um, obviously, if you only have one specimen, that's the best you can do. But if you have the opportunity to have uh, additional specimens, 
I like to go ahead and mount those within reason, of course, because this allows you to see some of the, the variation that is present within a population uh, versus just having a single measurement. Uh, sometimes that measurement is gets you directly to the, the place in the key where you want to go. Other times it may be right on the borderline, and so you might need what I would call a tiebreaker to look at another specimen to, to see where that measurement may lie. Now the question about uh, mixed infestations, uh, yes, they do, they do occur. And so in this case, um, it's very important to take a look at um, your, your sample set, uh, look at it uh, through a dissecting microscope, and, and do what I would call a, an initial morpho um, uh, determination, looking at, at the specimens to see if they're different from one another, and then sort of segregating those. If, if at all possible. But once you have your specimen on the microscope slide at a higher magnification and you're looking at the different structures, hopefully it'll become evident whether you're dealing with uh, a mixed infestation or a single species.